Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Secrets of My Success. Now, I know I always say we've got a very special guest, but we have indeed. We have Professor Sumitra Dutta, who's just been appointed. Well, I say just. It's been over a month, so that counts as just. University of Oxford Side Business School's Dean. Now, that's the number one university in the world. I don't mind saying it because I'm an alumnus. And the business school is right up there in the top, easily the top five, I would have thought, in the world, depending on how you measure these things. And I'm sure the professor is going to make it the best one in the world. His background is everything from associations with Cornell, INSEAD, and looking at this, the word innovation keeps coming up because uh, he co-chaired the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Innovation Ecosystems and created major global technology and innovation indices. He's also acted as senior advisor to governments on technology and innovation policies. That word innovation coming up. So if I might ask you, well, should I address you, Professor, Dean, or Sumitra? Which Whatever which... makes it comfortable, Alpesh. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interchange, actually. I'm going to kick off with Professor, and by the end of it, we're going to be friends, and I'll call you Sumitra. Now, this is, this is, we've got a broad audience. This is about some of the elements of success, and you will have had a heck of a lot of experience, both as somebody who's founded startups, both as somebody who's worked with World Economic Forum and as a dean of a business school and the work you did uh, at Cornell. What are the key traits which are lesser known? You know, we read in business books the more common themes like resilience, discipline, all those kinds of things. What would you say is often overlooked in terms of success, whether it's in a career, whether it's in entrepreneurship, or business, what would you say are the things you'd like to, you know, if you could drum into people and say, look, these are things so often overlooked, this is what I'd tell you? Well, that's an excellent question to begin with. And, you know, I could give you a long list of things, but let me emphasize one. And that is really the, <clears throat> what I would term as the power of serendipity. If you look at uh, anyone's life, anyone's career, and you just reflect on what were the key moments that shaped your life or shaped your career. You know, I would almost take a bet that for most of us, 80% of those key moments were unplanned and maybe at best 20% were planned. So if I look at my own life also, there were key moments of transitions in my own life. And I would say that, yes, some things like me wanting to go to the US for higher studies was planned and I did succeed in doing so. But so many other important ways in which my life was shaped and formed were completely unplanned. Happened because of the timing of where I was, happened because of the person I met with, who I was with, or whatever other reasons. Serendipity, I think, is very important. So what I think is an important lesson really out here is that don't overplan your life. And I always let students who come to the MBA program, they'll join the MBA program, they say, you know, I'm going to be an investment banker, I have to do this, and I have to have my investment banking, you know, let's say uh, internship, and then I do this, and I tell them, you know, just be a little bit more relaxed, you know, and give yourself the freedom to be surprised. Because you never know in a business school setting or in any other university setting who you'll meet, what kind of thoughts might come to you, and how you might change your own mind. So I think being ready and being willing to be surprised, uh, being a little bit unplanned, I think is very important. And that gives you the power of leveraging what I say, you know, our key moments serendipity. Do you know, I absolutely love that because it isn't common advice. And people sometimes at the end of a long list say, oh, and then there's luck, there's chance, and they under underway. And I love the fact that the dean of a business school says to the students as well, you know, plan for serendipity the, because as you rightly say you know i get a lot of these emails from people saying look i'm planning this with my life and this and this and what should i do about this tell me though how do you put yourself in a position as i would say the position to get lucky or as you might say a position such that serendipity can happen to you how do you put yourself in that position though you know sometimes you put yourself in a situation based on what you are doing or what you're trying to do. And sometimes you get put in a situation by others, you know, things happen. Um, and I think the important thing is, how are you responding to these kinds of moments? So typically what is important is being open, not having a closed window in terms of who you are and what you think your life should be and how you think you should evolve. 
uh, having some kind of a strong and supportive mentor network. And by mentor, I don't mean necessarily professional mentor, which is always very important and useful, but also mean on the personal side, people who know you well, you know, your partner, your, your, your child, your parent, uh, other kinds of friends. So having this kind of a mentor network is also very important. So I do believe that, uh, you know, if you are receptive, if you're open, if you have the right kind of people who really care about you and are able to give you a perspective, which is different from what you might have, you perhaps stand a better chance of being more receptive to these moments of serendipity. Now, you know, luck is as it is. Sometimes things work out, sometimes things don't work out. And you have to be also open to have failures. Uh, you might take a certain direction, take a certain job or do something. It may not actually work out the way you had thought it might. And that kind of resilience or being able to overcome these kind of, you know, failures or not even failures is not the right word, perhaps, you know, opportunities that do not work out in the way you thought it would or they would, but give you the chance to learn about something and more important, learn about yourself. So I think this combination of, you know, just being open and being resilient and being the, having the determination that doesn't matter what you keep yeah. on learning, that's important. I think that is uncommon wisdom. And I, I, I love that you've, you've mentioned it, given who you are as the messenger, because I think the same message coming from someone else would be overlooked, but I think it ca- carries that much more power coming from you. If I might move away to the topic then of innovation, as I said earlier in the introduction, you're, you're so associated with innovation and we know people who are innovative are more in demand, people who can shape policy and you've worked with governments. Now, I I have a role with um, our UK government's Department for International Trade, and and we bring entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs from around the world to the UK, and we're looking for the most innovative companies. Tell me, what would your advice be? It's a big question, I'm afraid. I'm putting you on the spot. What advice would you give, maybe not just the UK government, but other governments around the world, major Western governments, on innovation, on entrepreneurship, given your role at a business school, which is so able to shape that as well? So, you know, we have created something called the Global Innovation Index. Today is used by approximately 100 countries around the world. Uh, the United Nations adopted it as a model of innovation. It's published today by WIPO, which is the world intellectual property organization, Geneva, Switzerland. And what we have learned from over 15 years of research and data collection from this Global Innovation Index is that some things do matter at the national level. So it does matter if you have a national strategy that emphasizes innovation. Because innovation is not one small technical topic that is addressed by one department. Innovation is something that cuts across the entire economy and you have to have all parts of the government supporting the drive towards innovation. So it's like what I often term as the links in a chain. You know, If one link is weak, the entire thing might actually break apart. The chain may not be very strong. So it's very important to have strong links across all the different parts of the government. And that's the reason why a national strategy is very important out here. Second, what you realize is that uh, depending on what kind of an economy you have, because not all economies are high-income economies like in Europe and America, there are many low-income economies too in the world, and we want everyone to innovate because everyone can innovate. So what we find from our research is that the focus, while quite similar, does have to vary a little bit across levels of income. So we see, for example, the low-income economies What we see helping them much more is a focus on building strong institutions and investing in the human capital. So the more you invest in the education, university infrastructure, the more you invest in having a good environment, institutional structure, environment, that actually helps the country's innovation infrastructure. If you're a high income economy like the UK or other European countries or like America, you probably already have a pretty good level of investment in institutions and in human infrastructure, what makes the difference? You know, why does one high-income economy do better than other high-income economies? What makes the difference is the investment in digitalization, digital economy, in digitizing of the economy. 
So what we see is that digital technologies are a huge, huge multiplier of impact and the high income economies that are doing better in terms of digital adoption, digital resilience, digital technology are the ones that are doing better as compared to other, uh, other high income economies. So it varies, I think, but that's in a sense, you know, what I would suggest under the umbrella of having a national vision and national focus, which is very important. Thank you. And I know from our own department and, and- you know what we've been doing is going out to other parts of the world bringing those most innovative technologies and entrepreneurs because we don't have a monopoly on innovation of course we want to bring you mentioned human capital want to bring that human capital over here on that point and taking it one step further back to the original point about success the world of work has changed you know business schools from the 1960s and why somebody might have gone to them then has completely changed to today nowadays you know, you've got people who are hugely successful in business having left school at 16 they don't even think about university let alone a business school so what do you see what would you say to somebody who's saying look i want to be successful i'm 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 at the right level in my career to consider a business school how does this fit in to my achieving the successes i might want to achieve? What's the role now for a business school? What's your vision, for instance, with side business school and why it's going to be critical to somebody's success who might be in their 30s and 40s and thinking, yeah, well, should I go or should I not? Or should I just go into the digital economy and it's all, you know, like the Wild West and I don't need anything other than, you know, my wits? No, I think, you know, business schools in particular or universities in general serve a very important role in driving people, motivating people, especially young people to become innovative. And the major purpose, really, the major role played by these universities or business schools like the side school is of course, in imparting knowledge. You do impart, you don't learn from these kinds of experiences, but the most important component really is connections with other peers, connections with alumni, connections with other entrepreneurs because it is their success, it is their stories that inspires you. Because what's very important is that you have to be inspired to become an entrepreneur because you take risks when you become an entrepreneur. And you only do so when you are inspired, when you feel that, you know, that my colleague could do it or this alumnus could do it, so why can't I? I can also do the same. So I think business schools and universities form this great I would say, you know, uh, environment, a very fertile environment that not just only imparts knowledge, but enables people to build that connection ecosystem of human contacts, relationships that will serve them well, plus the same time helps them to get inspired to take risks and to be able to, you know, do great things in the future. You know, sometimes when I look at uh, young people who succeeded a lot in entrepreneurship, and compared to others, also young people done very well in other careers, the key difference that I find is not one of IQ. They all are very bright. The key difference really is the willingness to take risks and to persist across failures, or at least across challenges and overcome obstacles. And that's one reason why my advice to often young people now when, you know, when they graduate is very simple, is that you know, take more risks than what you think you want to take because now is the best time to take risks not when you're 45 or 50 and you have you know two mortgages and a family to support <laughs> so it's the best time to in fact go and take risks and you know see how you learn from those various experiences and let's let's I, I think that's absolutely fantastic advice because again as i say coming from you it counts for a lot more than work to come from anyone else and i think people uh, sometimes, uh, and, and I see it from the message I get, they're, well, even when they're young, they're a bit fearful. They feel they've got to go down this well-trodden path. And it means, you know, the traditional roles. But what you've said, because you've mentioned entrepreneurship, is you're creating your own company, as you've done with startups. You're creating your own, own venture. But let's just turn to those 45-year-olds you mentioned. Obviously, a school like Side Business School also caters to those later career or mid-career professionals. What, in terms of their success, does a school like this give them? Uh, Because, of course, people might have perceptions which are so different to reality. So, you know, if I'm a little bit over 40, I'm 45 plus VAT. What, what, 
and as an entrepreneur, what, what, what is it that I get which helps me succeed even more from a school like this? So, you know, anyone and everyone can innovate and be an entrepreneur. There's no question about it. It is just that our mindsets change over time. You know, one of my colleagues is a professor at MIT, Hal Gregerson. He always makes a very nice observation that if you look at a four-year-old child in any part of the world, a four-year-old child is always observing people, observing the environment, is always asking questions, is always experimenting and trying to do different things. And it never gives up, you know, even if the this gets hurt or breaks something, doesn't give up. And very important, has a mentor network, you know, parents, yeah. siblings, and so on to refer to and go and seek help. If you look at those characteristics, you know, of observation, of questioning, of experimentation, of resilience, of having a mentor network, those are exactly the characteristics of an innovative leader. You know, when people done studies of innovation, innovative leaders, those are the kind of things yeah. that people find. So the basic message out there is, you know, we have that innovation spirit built into us by in our DNA, human DNA. Now, the interesting question is what happens to the innovative spirit as we go through school, secondary school, university, and the work environment and so on, is that we get shaped. You know, we get shaped in all these yeah. different experiences and often the spark of innovation goes down. The spark of questioning goes down. The spark of being able to do different things goes down. So in effect, what we have to do right, right now is even if you're 45, even if you're 55, you have to rekindle that spirit of being a four-year-old. You have to look for the four-year-old inside you. And that four-year-old does exist. So the real, I think, benefit of coming to you know, a school like Saeed or another environment like that really is that you have a safe space away from a daily environment in which you can reflect, in which you can go back and question, and in fact, rekindle that, you know, that four-year-old spirit that you have and that you're born with. I absolutely love that because I've got a four-year-old son. and So you know what I'm talking about. I know exactly what you're talking about, not least because my son asked my wife and me, Daddy, how do they bring giraffes to the UK? And my wife and I, and I should tell you, my wife got a first in business studies. I was a don at Oxford University. I couldn't work it out. She couldn't work it out. And my son asked, how do they bring giraffes to the UK? I'm not going to give the audience the answer, but he worked out the answer and we were stumped and I couldn't believe how dumb I felt. But also, as you rightly said, uh, and, I, and I like the fact that you said it because as a dean of a business school, you, you, you'd expect people to say, think that you're going to say, oh, well, you know, there's, there's the journal of this. And of course, there are journals and there's the research and all the rest of it. But that passion, that energy, excitement that a four year old has and that, you know, a, a, and your focus, you're in the zone. Now, I'm going to ask this. There's two more last questions because I know we're, we're, we'll be short on time. So before before I ask, but m keep this at the back of your mind favorite books, favorite websites, you know, for success for, for, for our audience. So keep that sort of ticking along. Before I ask that one again, on this broader scope of success, we've got everybody here from, as I, as I mentioned before we started, from parliamentarians watching this, who are, you know, pinnacle of their political careers. So outside of business, all the way to entrepreneurs. And I should give a shout out to an organization you and I will be familiar with Thai, the Indus Entrepreneurs. I co-founded the UK chapter, and you will be familiar with them because of your work in America, because it's the world's largest entrepreneur mentoring organization, which was born out of the US. So in terms of mentoring, I'd recommend those. But we've got everybody from entrepreneurs to people who are not in business. They not don't see themselves in entrepreneurship, but they can help shape it. They're in the peripheries. What would be your success message to them in terms of mindset? Those who just look at business and say, oh no, business is for somebody else. And I mentioned this particularly in the current global economic and political environment. And they say to themselves, oh, entrepreneurship, no, that's for someone else. Uh, uh, my job is to do what I do and that's all I do. Because we've got to, we've got to, I almost do a PR job for business nowadays, you feel an, an entrepreneurship and its role in the economy. What would you say to those influencers and future leaders and current leaders on why it's so important, what, both what you're doing at your institution, but why it's important generally? No, my, my you know, comment always is that today we all realize we have to improve the world around us. You know, the world is in a pretty dire state in multiple aspects, not just the climate, but also inequality and so on. And of course, you know, there are three broad channels of impact. 
So one is the government. Government is a very important agent and a force of impact that can actually hopefully have a positive impact in general. Second is societal organizations, NGOs, social entrepreneurs, they all have very strong social motivations of doing good and that is very powerful. And the third is we should not forget is business. You know, business impacts a major part of the global GDP. Business typically is global in scale, has tremendous resources, and business is often the culprit in many cases of many of the wrongs that we're seeing today around us. So in that environment, my message really is that everyone should be working in business, with business, to try to get business to change and help make the world a better place. And I mean this very seriously. You know, it's not just a question of, I think social entrepreneurs are wonderful. They will do great things. Governments, if they are the right governments, can do great things too. But that's not often the case in many countries. But businesses cross, you know, cross national boundaries. They work across different you know, nations. And they have tremendous global scales. So if we can actually change business for the better, we have a tremendous potential impact on the life of our children and on the world around us. So I really, I really say whether you're an entrepreneur trying to create your own business or whether you're trying to work in a business and try and change the business, using business as a force for good is, I think, the ultimate reason why I think you know, uh, we should be all thinking about business and not ignoring it. I, I, yeah, I, I can see why you were appointed, um, Dean, and I'm not just saying this as, as just a, a, you know, a, 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 a boilerplate compliment. It, it has been inspiring listening to you and it's been uplifting listening to you because it's been a breath of fresh air from what you've said. So in, uh, uh, sadly, I've got to close things off with that final question that I mentioned earlier. In terms of success, people are watching this to get those tips and so on books websites anything else you'd recommend uh that they have a look at which has you know really inspired you and sort of blown your mind as it were yeah so what i what i think you know always i recommend is scan as many information sources as possible i think scanning is a very important uh you know i would say talent and a necessity today there's so much information. We're living in a world of too much information. There's books or websites or magazines, and there's too much information around us. So there's no way we can actually look at, look at everything. But having this ability to scan through information quickly and then to identify what are those few elements that strike you as interesting, important, and then to go more in depth on them. I think that for me is at least what I find, because you know, my mailbox like yours, I'm yeah, sure gets yeah. inundated with so many different newsletters and so many and you know, mm. things happening in the world. And I have to be able to use the most constrained resource that I have, which is time. All of us, the most constrained resource is time in the most effective manner. So I really think scanning intelligently and then deep diving selectively is what I think is the most important suggestion that I would make. That is phenomenal. And again, incredibly reassuring to hear you say that because I've been feeling a little bit guilty in doing that, thinking, oh, I'm not going into the depth I would have been expected by my professors when I was at university. But it's very reassuring that you said that because if you've said it and you're heading up one of the premier business schools in the world, then it's got to have that yeah. extra weight behind it. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor, well, Dean Professor Sumitra Dutta for giving of your time. And actually, I have to genuinely say, very uplifting and inspiring messages on this. I wish you so well. And I'm sure various parts of government will be in touch. I hope you'll find time for, for directing government policy as you've done before, but also for uplifting Oxford to even greater heights as well. Thank you so very much. I'm really, I'm really delighted you're in your role and uh, wish you all the best uh, in it as well. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having this conversation with you and I hope to meet you in Oxford someday. Absolutely. I'd love that. And, and uh, uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll be in touch.